Tonight on Reliving the War, a superstar is born. Months of waiting, months of video packages, months of hype, and months of frustration finally comes to an end. A master of the martial arts, a defender of good in the fight against evil, a hero that we've needed for so long. Tonight, live on Monday Nitro, Sub-Zero, uh, I mean Glacier, will leave Casa del Frosty Balls to do battle with his lifelong arch nemesis, Big Bubba. It's the night you've all been waiting for, and it happens now on Reliving the War. You want a war? You're gonna get one. Forget the lie, the money. We're in this together and through it out. They said that nothing's forever. It's September 16th, 1996, and we're going to go back in time to watch WWF Raw and WCW Nitro. Nitro is live tonight from Asheville, North Carolina, while the WWF are still showing taped matches from Wheeling, West Virginia. It's the night after Fall Brawl 1996, so let's take a look at the pay-per-view results before moving on to the first 60 minutes of Monday Nitro. Fall Brawl 96 took place in Winston-Salem, North Carolina on September 15th, 1996. The show drew just under 11,500 fans. Diamond Dallas Page defeated Chavo Guerrero in the opening match. DDP drilled Chavo's head to the mat after reversing a backslide with his signature diamond cutter. Mean Gene Okerlund gave us a special report where we caught up on the NWO storyline so far. Tonight's War Games match is all centered around Sting and Sting's perceived allegiance to the New World Order. A submission match between Scott Norton and Ice Train followed. Ice Train won the match with a full Nelson hold. Juventud Guerrera made his WCW pay-per-view debut by tripping over the steel steps during his entrance, but thankfully his footwork inside both rings was absolutely fantastic, even though he ended up losing to Conan. Conan got the win with a crucifix powerbomb. Chris Jericho also made his WCW pay-per-view debut in a match with Chris Benoit. A back suplex from the top rope was enough to put Y2J away. But still, check this one out. Not their best match together, but it's still very good. Rey Mysterio successfully defended the Cruiserweight title when he defeated Super Kolo with an insane double springboard Frankensteiner. The Cruiserweights were having fun with those two rings. Harlem Heat defeated the Nasty Boys when Robert Parker distracted the referee and Jerry Sags. This allowed Sherry to jump into the ring and hit Brian Nobbs with a cane. Randy Savage had the giant beat in the semi-main event of the evening, but the Macho Man ended up walking into an NWO trap on the entranceway. Nick Patrick didn't say a thing, of course. Savage got dumped back into the ring and the giant scored the pinfall win. As the War Games cage began to lower, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson and Lex Luger, who looked like he only crawled out of bed, they cut a promo backstage. Sting showed up and Luger wanted to know why his partner attacked him on Monday Nitro. Sting says it wasn't him, but Lex Luger doesn't believe Sting. I mean, we all saw Sting attack Luger with the NWO, so why should the total package believe him? This War Games match was a little different. Because of the animosity between WCW and NWO, the superstars wouldn't stand around the cage, but instead they would come out from the back when it was their time to enter the match. Sting came out and it looked like he was a member of the New World Order, but if you look closely, you'd be able to tell that this wasn't the real Sting. The real Sting did come out a little later and he cleaned house. Sting then looked at Luger and he asked if that was good enough proof that he was 
wasn't part of the New World Order before walking out of the match. Sting walking away here was the beginning of the Crow character within World Championship Wrestling. Luger ended up submitting when the fake Sting applied a Scorpion Deathlock. The Macho Man tried to attack Hulk Hogan after the match, but he got destroyed by the NWO. Elizabeth tried to protect Savage, but she ended up getting her back spray painted. The crowd were absolutely silent as they witnessed complete domination from the New World Order, and the show goes off the air with the broadcast team getting chased away from their announced desk. Fall Brawl 1996, in my opinion, is a great show from start to end that has a great balance of in-ring action and storytelling. There's been better War Games matches in the past, but this one is still very entertaining. Tony Schiavone apologises for doubting Sting, but Larry Zbysko says it's too late for apologies. The living legend says if Sting's feelings are hurt and if he's so sensitive, then he should get a job working for Mother Teresa. Footage is shown of people walking around backstage handing out NWO propaganda, propaganda that Larry calls toilet paper. Juventud Guerrera and Rey Mysterio started the in-ring action off with an excellent matchup. The finish where Rey reversed a top row powerbomb with a Frankensteiner was absolutely breathtaking. Steve McMichael and Chris Benoit then got interviewed backstage and the horsemen are annoyed that Sting and Luger cost Team WCW the War Games match last night. The two men argue that the result would have been different had the horsemen entered the cage as a group and tonight Mongo and Chris want a little revenge. Benoit and Mongo vs Sting and Luger is our scheduled main event. Also guys, at the time of scripting this video, Steve McMichael isn't doing too well. I know this kind of goes against the stuff we do here on Reliving the War, but it's been reported that Steve has ALS and he's declining quickly. A GoFundMe has been set up to make his living arrangements a little more bearable, and it looks like the target is going to get reached very soon. Just want to make you guys aware. We all have fun with Steve's matches, but that doesn't change the fact that it absolutely sucks seeing him the way he is now. So yeah, spare a thought for Steve and his family. Glacier talks about Glacier next. Our IC Overlord is finally gonna wrestle tonight on Monday Nitro, and any excitement that I would have had has been completely drained from my soul over these past few months. But yeah, Glacier talks here and he's giving us his backstory. Glacier says that Glacier itself is a spirit that lives inside of him. The name was given to him by his master, and it's an appreciation of the elements and the power that he derives from those elements. I'm trying to say this without laughing, but I've got a big smile on my face at the moment. Seeing Bruce Lee made Glacier want to learn martial arts, so he packed up his shit in a black garbage bag and he travelled to Kyoto, Japan. He found an old teacher who became his sensei, let's say his name is Grandmaster Sensei, and so Glacier's training had begun. Glacier doesn't have a name for his style of martial arts, but it's a combination of a few forms along with pro wrestling, creating a hybrid style that Glacier thinks will bring him tons of success along with that sweet main event money. He then talks about his attire. The symbol on his belt represents the universe, the symbol above his eye represents ice, and the shield on his back is a Japanese evil, always there to remind our frosty friend that evil could be lurking behind his back at all times. It also represents respect and honour. Glacier then pulls out his dictionary and he tells us that the word glacier refers to a mass of moving ice and Glacier says that he himself is a mass of ice that moves towards his opponents, more like a mass of shit. And the promo ends with Glacier saying he will conquer his opponents in the ring. And that's it, that's our hero's backstory, beautiful. Glacier will be in action later tonight, around 4-5 to five months after the first Blood Runs Cold promo aired on Monday Nitro. 
DDP versus Ice Train was next, but we didn't even see the finish of the match live. The cameras cut to the NWO boys out in the lobby who have cordoned off the WCW merchandise stand. We have to wait for a replay to see the match finish. An Ice Train got Paige in a full Nelson and Teddy Long was on the ropes holding a towel. Paige managed to grab the towel and throw it in the ring and Nasty Nick Patrick called for the bell, deeming DDP the winner. The 123 Kid was then seen in the audience. Shivani announces that Sean Waltman has been released from his WWF contract and Larry is immediately suspicious. It's likely that Kid will join the New World Order. The Dungeon of Doom's Conan then defeated Super Kolo with a power bomb. Another decent cruiserweight match here with Super Kolo in particular pulling off some great aerial attacks. Mike Tanay interviews the 123 Kid. Kid says his contracts have finished up and he just returned from Japan. He's here to see the guys of WCW do what they do best and that's it. When Mike asks Kid if he saw the War Games match, Kid says he didn't. And when Tanay tells Waltman that the NWO won their match, Kid says, darn it, that's too bad. Our number one comes to an end with a Hugh Morris vs Brad Armstrong match. This one was pretty short, but we finally got to see Armstrong pick up a victory on Nitro. Brad got the win with a backslide. A great first hour of WCW Nitro, WCW gets the unopposed point this week. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash are shown on WWF television during the beginning of Raw. Gorilla Monsoon is going to address the rumours that Jim Ross has been spreading on TV regarding the return of Diesel and Razor Ramon. The WWF also hype up tonight's main event, Farouk vs Sid in the IC title tournament. WCW Nitro continues with Scott Norton vs Randy Savage while the WWF give us Jake the Snake Roberts vs The Sultan. Jake comes out first and he chases Jerry Lawler away but Lawler comes back with Bob Backlund, The Iron Sheik and The Sultan. Make a difference Fatu wasn't cutting it and so we have The Sultan. The problem here is that you can instantly tell that this was Fatu. I don't think that mask was fooling anyone. As Jake looks on, knowing he's going to get destroyed here, Jerry Lawler gives us some backstory in regards to the Sultan. He was once held as a hostage and he got his tongue cut out. Not sure which is worse, Sultan's backstory or Glacier's. Bob Backlund has joined the commentary team and Backlund reveals that the Sultan's training has all been handled by the Iron Sheik. Our match gets underway and the Sultan overpowers Jake. Jake does get a brief opportunity to hit a DDT but the Sultan slips out of the ring. It looks like Jake is more concerned with Jerry Lawler as our match continues. Jake and Sultan trade wrist locks as Jim Ross tells us that there's going to be a bombshell announcement tonight in regards to Diesel and Razor. The Sultan manages to bring Jake to the corner and the snake gets whipped from turnbuckle to turnbuckle. Jake then gets another chance to hit the DDT but he gets distracted again by Jerry Lawler. The King throws something into the ring and this gives the Sultan an opportunity to finish the match off with a camel clutch. It was a miniature drink bottle that Jerry tossed into the ring. In terms of debuting a new character, this was pretty bad. The Sultan wasn't even allowed to be overly dominant, seeing as he needed this distraction from Lawler to pick up the win. Nothing special at all. The Macho Man gets interviewed by Mike Tanay before his match. Tanay reminds Savage about the ambush last night at Fall Brawl, but now it's time for the Macho Man to look ahead. Savage vs Hogan is going to take place at Halloween Havoc. Savage says he's not at rock bottom, he's a million miles below rock bottom, he's only got one marble left and he doesn't mind if he loses it. Things are going to get scary when Savage gets in the ring with Hollywood Hogan on pay per view. The NWO then show up in their limousine outside and the imposter Sting comes out wearing an NWO shirt. That's six NWO members there ladies and gentlemen and later on the seventh member will get added who will end up getting called 
Six. Bischoff says a little later on this very show that Kid is called Six because he's the sixth member, but maybe they were only counting active wrestlers or something? Who knows? But anyway, Scott Norton vs Randy Savage, the two men fight on the entranceway and back inside the ropes, Savage gets the upper hand with a back body drop followed by a double axe handle to the outside. Norton turns things around with a Samoan drop when both men get back in the ring, and Eric Bischoff talks about the upcoming WCW tour of Japan. Bischoff realises that he's left guys like Randy Savage out to dry by agreeing to send some big WCW superstars over to New Japan for a few weeks, and it's also revealed that this is why Sting hadn't been on Nitro in the run up to Fall Brawl, he was gone promoting these New Japan shows. That's all fine and dandy, but wouldn't Sting tell his best friend Lex Luger that he was going to Japan? Savage is taking a beating inside the ring here, the Macho Man takes clotheslines, power bombs, and power slams, but he keeps kicking out. He gets a brief comeback opportunity after moving out of the corner when Norton came dashing in. Savage hits a clothesline and he sends his opponent to the outside. Randy brings the pain at ringside by whipping Norton into the guardrails and slamming him on the protective mats. Norton replies with a DDT inside the ring, and our guy here then does the truffle shuffle in the crowd before Scott Norton delivers a massive shoulder breaker. The fight spills to the outside once again where Savage rams Norton into the ring post before picking up a steel chair. Norton gets levelled and the referee calls for the bell. Norton wins via disqualification. Nick Patrick shows up and Randy pushes him away. Patrick sells it like he just got his neck snapped in half. And our segment comes to an end with the commentary team talking about how unhinged the Macho Man is right now. This is gonna be an easy point for Monday Nitro. The Nitro match wasn't even that good, but the stuff that happened in the ring was leagues better than the Sultan vs Jake Roberts. It's time, the moment has arrived, Glacier makes his WCW Nitro debut next against Big Bubba, while the Smoking Guns do battle with Bob Holly and Alex the Pug Porto. Before the Raw match, we get a quick interview with Brian Pillman and Owen Hart. These two are still promising us that Brett is going to show up at Mind Games, and Steve Austin interrupts the promo to say he's also going to be at Mind Games, and he has a few words for the Hitman. The Smoking Guns are going to defend the tag titles at Mind Games against Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith, but right now, they got to deal with the legendary team of Alex Porto and Bob Holly. Raw is brought to us this week by Tekken 2, by the way, what a great sponsor. Sunny shows off her giant poster to the fans in attendance before our match gets underway. Billy and Bob Holly start things off and Bob gets the upper hand. Owen Hart, Davy Boy Smith and Jim Cornette then show up as Jim Ross makes a pretty insane announcement on commentary. Big Daddy Cool Diesel and Razor Ramon will be live on Raw next week. Ross guarantees that Diesel and Razor will be standing in a WWF ring live on Raw. Bart Gunn and Bob Holly are now in the ring while Kevin Kelly and Jerry Lawler try to wrap their heads around what Jim Ross just announced. How could this be happening? Kemp Cornette sit at ringside to get a closer look at the action as our match continues. Alex Porto is now in the ring and he isn't doing so well against Bart Gunn. Billy comes in for some double team action and the smoking guns are now getting a little anxious about Kemp Cornette sitting at ringside. Quick tags allow Billy and Bart to stay on top of things and Bart Gunn mocks the British Bulldog by performing a running power slam. Billy Gunn showboating causes the smoking guns to lose their advantage, Porto is eventually able to tag in Holly, and Sparkplug cleans house before performing a Frankensteiner on Billy Gunn, it only gets a two count. Holly's momentum gets taken away when Bart Gunn ensures that the race driver can't jump from the top rope. The smoking guns are then able to hit the sidewinder, but Owen Hart jumps up on the apron while holding his soft drink. Billy Gunn slaps the drink out of Owen's hand, but then Bob Holly performs a roll up and the tag team champions take a loss on Monday Night Raw. That's two match finishes on Raw that's involved beverages by the way. The match was okay, it's the stuff about Razor and Diesel that was really intriguing here.
The lights in the Asheville Civic Center turn to blue as that familiar techno syndrome ripoff music plays in the arena. Synthetic snow falls from the ceiling as blue lasers shoot out from the entranceway. And here, live all the way from Casa del Frosty Balls in Kyoto, Japan, is the man they call Glacier. No joke, it was reported that this entrance cost WCW in the region of half a million dollars in production costs. This was according to WCW producer Keith Mitchell, and specialists had to be paid also to ensure the entrance played out the way it was supposed to. Glacier's full costume also cost around 35 grand apparently. Raymond Lloyd said as much in an interview. That's a lot of money for a Mortal Kombat ripoff character. We have joked about this, but obviously the character was inspired by the video game and the success the video game had on the youth of America. And yeah, this is it guys, months of waiting. Glacier is now part of WCW Nitro and he's gonna face Big Bubba tonight. The blue lights stay on during the matchup, thankfully this would get dropped soon enough, and Glacier bows down to the referee as our match gets underway. Bubba wants Glacier to bow down to him, Bubba tries to perform a snake attack but Glacier is one step ahead. Bubba again tries to go after our frosty friend, but Glacier controls a sidekick and Bubba has to rethink his strategy. Again, Glacier is just too fast for Bubba, everything is getting countered here, and I'm gonna admit it, Glacier is looking pretty good, sends a shiver up my spine just saying that. Bubba grabs Glacier's food and he slaps him around a few times, and I'm gonna replay this. Glacier, this is for all those weeks where you didn't show up. Glacier is able to get out of this predicament and he begins toying with his opponent, throwing kicks that Bubba has to dodge. Bubba then goes to the outside and Glacier gets his neck snapped across the top rope. This lets Bubba go on offense for a little and Glacier takes a spine buster. Bubba mocks Glacier afterwards by doing his best Daniel LaRusso, but Glacier performs his ice slide special move to get back on his feet. A spinning leg sweep brings Bubba to the mat, and Glacier performs his super combo that ends with his leg getting wrapped around Bubba's arm and Glacier's foot getting smashed into Bubba's face. More kicks from Glacier follows, and Glacier ends the match with a spinning side kick, scoring the pinfall win at around two and a half minutes. Absolutely disgusted with myself, but this point is going to WCW Nitro. The debut of Glacier may not have delivered on literal months of hype, but it was still better than the Raw Tag Team match featuring Bob Holly and Alex the Pug Porto. So congratulations Glacier. The segment ends with Chili Boy doing another Kung Fu demonstration in the middle of the ring. Welcome to the WCW Midcard, son. Sting makes a surprise appearance next on Nitro to cut a promo while Gorilla Monsoon talks about Diesel and Razor Ramon. We also have a Vader and Jim Cornette promo on Raw. Gorilla says that Jim Ross has piqued his interest in regards to who's going to show up next week. Monsoon officially announces that Kevin Nash and Scott Hall will not be appearing on WWF television because they are currently under contract to another wrestling organisation. Monsoon apologises to fans who may have felt misled by JR's comments, and Gorilla says he's going to continue watching Raw while listening out for any other lies being told by commentators and the like. If anyone talks shit, then Gorilla is going to beat their asses. During the promo, someone dropped a frying pan or something. Have a listen. Remain here in the studio for the rest of the program to monitor it. And Remember guys, this was a taped show. Jim Cornette and Vader are in the ring and Cornette has promised to give us a public workout tonight. Cornette says there's a lot going on in his professional life recently, from Vader beating Shawn Michaels but not winning the title, to Clarence Mason and Sonny trying to worm in and steal his talent. But if that's not bad enough, Cornette has to step into the ring with Jose Lothario at a new house. Cornette says he's been getting training from the man they call Vader and at mind games, Cornette is going to embarrass Jose Lothario in the middle of the ring. Tony Williams is in the ring at the moment and Cornette says he's going to have a little workout. 
this isn't going to be a match. Cornette just wants to show a few things that Vader has taught him. Williams was a USWA wrestler, by the way. He made a few WWF appearances, but always as a job guy. He was actually a job guy to the job guys, imagine that. He would do a little better in the late 90s as part of Power Pro Wrestling in Memphis. Anyway, the public workout begins and Cornette looks pretty good, but Williams begins reversing Cornette's holds. Lawler tells Tony that this is a public workout and he shouldn't be countering moves. Williams then performs a headlock takedown followed by an ankle lock, and this is enough to make Vader step in. Vader pummels Williams, and the segment ends with Cornette tying the youngster up in the ropes and slapping him around a little. Sting shows up unannounced and he's here to talk to everyone involved in World Championship Wrestling. This is a pretty iconic segment right here. With his back to the hard camera, Sting explains that he tuned into Nitro last week and he thought he was watching a rerun. He saw himself on TV. Sting also saw commentators, wrestlers and even his best friend doubt the stinger and he heard Lex Luger saying that he was coming to get him. Sting then showed up at Fall Brawl so he could go face to face with his best friend and Sting wanted to tell Lex Luger that he had nothing to do with the NWO. But before the War Games match, Luger told Sting that he didn't believe him. Sting has given Luger the benefit of doubt for months and Sting has carried the WCW banner for years. So for the people who didn't doubt him, Sting says that he'll still stand for those people. If the fans and wrestlers stand by Sting, then the icon will do the same in return. But for those commentators and those wrestlers and those fans who doubted Sting, those people can stick it. Sting announces that he's a free agent, but he's gonna show up every now and then when we least expect it. And that's it, say goodbye to Sting as we have known him throughout this entire series. Bischoff says that Sting has turned his back on WCW and Heenan says that a bidding war is now gonna begin for one of WCW's most important superstars. It's another point for WCW Nitro. Chris Jericho and Buff Bagwell do battle with Arn Anderson and Ric Flair next while the WWF presents Owen Hart vs Mark Merrow, a semi-final match in the IC title tournament. Jim Ross says that he's hurt by Gorilla Monsoon's comments and JR hasn't misled anyone. Pat Patterson, the first ever IC champion, is going to provide commentary for this match and it's announced that Patterson will officiate the finals of the tournament next week live on Raw. Owen does his handstand reversal and Mero replies by doing the exact same counter. Mero follows up with some arm drags next and Mero keeps control of the arm by going through the same sequence, not once but twice. A spinning wheel kick brings Owen back into the match and Owen keeps his momentum with a double underhook suplex. Hart then shows that he's been attending the school of Davy Boy Smith chinlocks as Sable looks on. Ross on commentary begins defending his recent claims in regards to Diesel and Razor and this causes Gorilla Monsoon to appear via split screen. Gorilla says that he's putting his friendship with Jim Ross aside to say that JR needs to scrutinise his sources a bit more. Nothing has came across Gorilla's desk to indicate Nash and Hall are coming back and JR says he's never let Gorilla down in the past with false information and not everything is brought to the attention of the WWF president. Gorilla says we'll see next week how reliable Jim Ross is in terms of these insane claims that he's making on TV. Merrill fights out of the chin lock but Owen comes back with a neck breaker. The King of Hearts then nails a missile drop kick but Merrill kicks out at two. Chin lock number two gets applied and Mero gets out with a side suplex. Mero then runs into his opponent but Owen hits the wild man with his cast, sending Mero out of the ring. Sable helps Mero on the outside just before we go to commercial break and when we come back, Owen is still in control. Hart then misses a corner attack and this allows Mero to start building momentum. The wild man nails a dropkick that sends Owen to the outside and a somersault plancha from Mero finds its target. Mero then comes back into the ring with a splash from the apron but Owen kicks out. This one has been pretty good so far. The two men hit the mat after butting heads and this allows Owen to take his cast off and nail his opponent. Mero still manages to kick out and when Owen Owen complains to the referee, Mero is able to take the cast and Owen gets a taste of his own medicine. 
Mark Merrow wins via pinfall and so the wild man will wrestle next week in the IC tournament finals. We then get some clips from the WWF's recent tour of South Africa and we get a quick interview with Bret Hart. Bret says he will not be at Mind Games this Sunday, Brian Pillman and Owen are just flat out lying and Bret says he still hasn't decided what he's going to do yet in terms of his WWF future. That's all well and good but what about those people who bought the pay per view last week when it was announced that Brett will be at In Your House? It's dodgy as fuck. Just like before, I asked my Twitter followers to come up with a name for Buff Bagwell's team this week and again we got some gold here. Bags of Jericho, Bag is Jericho, Success and Failure, Little Bit of the Buffly, The Outer Circle, Not Fucking Glacier, Lion Fart, Lion Shart, Jericho and the Gigolo, Chris and Delish, Why 2 Jim Ross Cost Me My Job, Vest Friends, Jerino, Chris and Marcus, Adventure Lads, The Pill Seekers, The Ayatollahs of Judy on Apolas, but the one I'm going for is the Can Armor action. Good job, everyone. Before the match begins, Miss Elizabeth refuses to come out of the arena. She's been shaken up by what happened at Fall Brawl last night, and she isn't in the mood to bring Double A and Flair to the ring. Once all competitors are in the ring, Sean Waltman stands up and he presses a button on a remote control. This causes NWO flyers to fall from the ceiling and now these four have to wrestle in this fucking mess. Way to go. Bischoff says that Waltman must be the sixth member of the NWO, even though there's already six including DBRC and the fake Sting, and we take a quick commercial break before our match gets underway. When we come back, Bischoff shows us some of the flyers that have fell into the arena. The Enforcer powers out of a Chris Jericho side headlock, Double A goes on offense for a little, but Chris fires back with a top rope dropkick. Some back and forth action leads to Anderson taking a spinning wheel kick as the commentary team try to wrap their heads around everything that's happened. Sting's announcement, Sean Waltman showing up, the Flyers. Bischoff even announces that he had to give the NWO their own TV show as Flair and Bagwell continue to work. Eric says that in order to get the NWO into the cage for war games, he had to agree to give the Heel Faction their own exclusive TV show. We'll talk more about this as Reliving the War continues. Slick Rick delivers a big chop to Marcus Bagwell but the future buff daddy fires back, eventually leading to Rick taking a back body drop in the middle of the ring. A drop kick from Bagwell follows and so far the can armor action have been pretty good at keeping the horsemen at bay. Flair gets clotheslined over the top rope and he just loses it on the outside. He begins grabbing NWO flyers as Bobby Heenan explains that the New World Order are causing guys to completely lose control of their emotions. We go back to Arn and Jericho and Y2J takes a spine buster. We then get Flair and Jericho in the ring and it turns into your standard tag team match from this point forward. Jericho just needs to make the hot tag. We see the NWO outside the arena and it's confirmed that Sean Waltman is a member. We also get confirmation that the NWO played a recording of Sting during the Lex Luger ambush. And check this out, the group are all making jokes, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall make the NWO laugh, but when the giant tries to deliver a line, the whole faction goes completely quiet. When in doubt, NWO! <laughs> Good job bro. <laughs> Poor giant. We go back to the ring, Bagwell gets tagged in but he ends up taking a figure 4. His shoulders are counted to the mat and the horsemen pick up the victory. The Raw match was better, in my opinion anyway, so congratulations Raw, have a point. Main event time and WCW has a problem, no one knows if Sting is going to show up for the match. It's scheduled as Sting and Luger vs Benoit and Mongo, while the WWF presents the second semi-final match of the IC title tournament, Farouk vs Psycho Sid. Jim Ross doesn't care what Gorilla Monsoon says, he's still promising us that Diesel and Razor will be on Raw next week as the competitors make their way down to the ring. The match starts off with both men trying shoulder blocks but neither man budges. Farouk 
takes a shortcut and Sid gets put on the mat, Farouk then hits a huge power slam, but Sid no sells it like 1995 Hulk Hogan. A few punches and a big boot then send Farouk to the canvas as Sonny looks on from ringside. Sid begins dictating the pace with some slow yet powerful right hands in the corner. Sid then gets launched into the opposite corner and Farouk folds Sid in half with a back suplex. Farouk has been seriously impressive so far. Chin lock time, let's see if Farouk can keep the chin lock count below 3 this week. Ahmed Johnson appears via split screen where he sends a message to our blue Roman gladiator friend. Ahmed is gonna light his ass up apparently. Sid fights out with a few back elbows but Farouk fires back with a body slam before going to the top rope. Farouk jumps off but Sid catches his opponent in mid air before performing a power slam. It's all big and impactful moves tonight in the Raw main event and it's been great so far. A double clothesline floors both men as the competitors catch their breath a little. Farouk goes for a sit down splash on Sid's back, but Mega Man lands right on his mega hole. Farouk then gets angry and he begins targeting the kidney area, and this is enough to bring Psycho Sid down. We come back from commercial break and Farouk hits a diving headbutt. Farouk then goes for a dominator, but Sid reverses it. We then see a choke slam, but Sid is unable to pin his opponent afterwards. Sonny then distracts the referee and Farouk grabs a chair. Sid gets nailed but he still kicks out at two. Enraged, Sid takes the steel chair and the referee sees Sid attacking Farouk, meaning Farouk wins via disqualification. The first chair shot was a bit weak too, it looks like Farouk took the bump before getting hit, but still, this was a solid enough main event from Raw. Here's the tournament brackets then, Mero vs Farouk will take place next week on Raw, and a new Intercontinental Champion will get crowned. Raw ends with The Undertaker cutting a short promo on Goldust and Mankind cutting a brief promo on Shawn Michaels. And we also get a rundown of the In Your House matches, I'll talk about mind games next week. Sting does not show up for his scheduled tag team match, so it's Mongo and Benoit against Lex Luger. Benoit starts off strong, but Luger manages to hit a back body drop. Lex then tries to go after Mongo on the ring apron, and this is a mistake. Benoit capitalized before tagging in Steve McMichael, so let's see what happens here. Mongo tries a pile driver, but Luger counters. There's a slight communication problem when Lex is supposed to duck a clothesline, and Mongo still hits Lex's midsection, but it still looked okay. Lex is taking care of both horsemen, and so Benoit decides to come back into the fight. Benoit decimates Luger as the commentators talk about how Sting has turned his back on everyone. Anytime Luger gets an opportunity to build offense, the numbers game comes into play, and so things aren't looking too good for the total package. Mongo comes back in with an elbow drop. A few mounted punches from McMichael get delivered before Benoit again comes back into the match, and you can tell they're keeping Steve's time inside the ropes as limited as possible here. More punishment from Chris Benoit and more double team shenanigans follows, and everyone is just hoping that Sting shows up. Eventually, Luger is able to get Mongo away from the apron, and Benoit takes a power slam. The torture rack then gets applied and the other two horsemen run in to cause a DQ finish. Lex tries to fight all four men but it's no use. The total package gets destroyed and Sting does not appear. Bischoff then says he's gotten word that Sean Waltman is calling himself Six because he's the sixth member of the NWO. And then we go back outside to see the giant has been kicked out of the limo for his shit jokes that no one laughs at. Inside the limo, the NWO are planning to attack Randy Savage next week, seeing as half the WCW roster will be going to Japan and Savage will be left all alone. The final point goes to WWF Raw. Nitro wins another episode of Reliving the War. Raw got better as the show went on, but it wasn't enough to secure the win. Our overall scores are now 17 points to Raw, 26 points to Nitro and we've got 6 ties. WCW Nitro wins once again in the television rating, scoring a 3.7 over Raw's 2.1. It must have been pretty alarming for the WWF to see their go home shows and their pay per view fallout shows doing so poorly in the weekly ratings. 
Next week, we'll see if Jim Ross really did bring Diesel and Razor back to the WWF, and we'll also crown a new Intercontinental Champion, thank God. And over on Nitro, the New World Order show up and they take over the entire broadcast. New World Order fans won't want to miss this one. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and take care. A big thank you to those who support me on Patreon. We've got some extra content up there now, including some watch-alongs. So if that sounds like something you'd like to check out, then please do have a look at my Patreon page. We've got a few Hall of Famers that I'd like to give a shout out to, and those are Stephen and Kieran. So thanks very much, you guys, for helping me continue to do this show. And a big thank you to everyone who supports on Patreon.